I thought I'd uh, print out the Bible verses this morning, so they're not on the screen, and um, I haven't put the Bibles out either. Um, so you've got the uh, Bible text in front of you. Now, I'm looking at, we're gonna, I'm going to start a new series, uh, actually, for this uh, autumn term, which is looking at the Christian and different things. So we're going to look at work and various other things. Um, but uh, today we're looking at being a Christian and church. So what does it mean uh, to be part of church? I wonder why you've come this morning. <laughs> did you come because you felt you had to, felt you ought to? It's, did you come because it's your habit, it's just what you do on a Sunday morning? Uh, did you come because you thought you might get something out of it? Um, did you come because you enjoy the worship? Did you come in the hope you might hear a good speaker? Um, no chance. <laughs> no chance, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know, why did you come? Why did you bother coming here on a Sunday morning? To praise the Lord. To praise the Lord, okay. To praise the Lord. Sorry? To encourage others. To encourage others, wonderful. Healing. Sorry, for healing. healing. Yeah. Thank you for all his goodness. Thank him for all his goodness. Praise God. Yeah. Did I just see a little glass fall into your other glass? That's like to be filled. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> a well with it. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Well. Do you know, Jesus is here. Yeah. Jesus is here. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I will be there with them. Now that's the question. Why does Jesus bother turning up? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. Brilliant answer. Okay, right, that's my, that's my talk done. Okay, that's my talk. <laughs> because he loves, okay, he loves the church. Listen to this in Ephesians 5 on, on your piece of paper. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, in a lot of Bibles, actually, this is headed up husbands and wives. I'm going to ignore the husbands and wives, and I'm focusing on a bit about Jesus here, okay? And it says, Wives, submit to yourselves to your own husbands, as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, <laughs> as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, and this is a pretty high calling, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless in this way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies he who loves his wife loves himself after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now here's the thing, you see, Christ loves the church. Christ loves the church. So much that he gave himself for her. Now here's the thing, okay, I mean, we can sometimes look around and we can think church could be a bit of a disaster sometimes, can't it? Okay? There's lots of issues in all sorts of different churches. Some matter which church you go to, you know? I mean, you might like have church, you think it's a fantastic church, that's brilliant, it is a good church. Okay, but... Actually, we are not perfect, okay? We're not perfect. There's faults everywhere. Partly because each of us has faults, including ourselves as leaders. We're not perfect. But here's the thing. Christ loved the church even before the church came into being and certainly before the church was perfect. Christ loves the church because of where he is taking us to be. He has in his mind that future perspective of what the church is going to be like. 
And you know, I mean, it's occurred to me actually during the, during the prayer sessions was, um, you know, it's coming that day when Christ returns. And I was just imagining this, you know, imagine Christ came right at this moment and we all start going up together to be with him. Isn't that exciting? I think it's exciting, yeah. I think it'd be amazing, wouldn't it? Absolutely awesome. Just imagine you coming on a Sunday morning about <laughs> quarter past 11 and we just all start going up to be with him in the clouds. Wow! Okay. <laughs> and, and, and here's the thing, okay. Just, just keep some of that in your mind because actually that's what God's doing for each one of us here and we're going to be together into eternity and each of us is going to be perfected in him we're no longer going to rub each other up the wrong way we're no longer going to pursue our own interests in any way love is about pursuing the interests of others and Christ's interest is totally for the church that's why he gave himself up for her He's totally committed to the church. Do you realise how committed Christ is to the church? I mean, it says there, he gave himself up for her. He laid himself down on the altar. So that he, so that the church could come to reality. And be in eternity with him. <clears throat> and he is making us as a church holy blameless and we're going to be presented as a radiant church how good is that yeah how good is that we're going to be presented as a radiant church without any blemish stain or wrinkle but holy and blameless you see as, yeah, the reality is as human beings okay as we get older and this is no insult to anybody we get more wrinkles yeah we all get more wrinkles as we get older but the church is the other way around the wrinkles are being ironed out by Jesus Christ. How good is that? You see, Christ's key project at this point in time is the church. That's what he's doing. That is what he's doing on earth. He's building the church. That's what Christ is about. How awesome is that? You know, he's really focused. Christ is really focused. He knows what he's doing. He's got eternity in sight. He's got a day when he's coming again in sight. And he is building the church for that occasion because he loves the church and he wants us to be with him forever now here's the thing is if I consider myself a follower of Jesus Christ then one of the things that you know those little bracelets which say WWJD what would Jesus do and so as a follower of Jesus Christ I can expect that he's going to put in me a love for the church that's part of his work that's part of his salvation that's part of what he does in us fills us with a love for the church so that we also are ready to lay ourselves down yes we lay ourselves down for Jesus Christ but actually if we're laying ourselves down for Jesus Christ part of that at any rate is laying ourselves down for his church that his church might become without wrinkle, without blemish, holy and blameless. So that's my first thing. Christ and the church. Look at Christ and the church. And actually being a Christian in the church is actually about having a love for the church. Irrespective, not because of what it's like, but because of where we're going to be. Secondly, I want to look at God and the church. And um, you can see it here in 1 Corinthians 14. It says, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregation of the Lord's people. God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Notice the, uh, the sort of contrast there is not between disorder and order per se, but between disorder and peace. You see, God's not a God of disorder. He took chaos and formed it into the universe, which actually is incredibly structured and ordered, so that people like Ian can have a job teaching physics, because it always works in the same way. Doesn't it, Ian? Yeah. Yeah? 
Yep, it always works in the same way. There's these basic physical orders in place. And God is about harmony. See, when we read that word peace, I'm pretty sure that in Paul's mind as he writes, he's thinking about the Hebrew word shalom, which is a deep word for peace, but it kind of goes beyond just a peace on the surface. It goes for a deep harmony. Now, I love when people are singing in harmony. Yeah, I mean, like Caroline sings in harmony, it's a trike and Andrea, and it's, it's a beauty to it, isn't it, when people are singing in harmony with one another. What it means is you're, you're singing, you know, in harmony, you're, you're singing something slightly different, but which goes with everything else that's going on around. Is that right, Caroline? Yeah, okay. Slightly different, but it fits with everything else around. And God is building a church of harmony. We're all slightly different. But it's about fitting with what else is around. And what does that take? If you're singing in harmony, I mean, I, I'm not an expert in harmonies, but Caroline is here, so I'm just looking to her for <laughs> confirming what I'm saying. But here's the thing you have to listen to what's going on around, what other people are doing and singing, and then you're pitching in to fit in with that. Is that right? Is that a good description? Okay. Uh, so I, so that, that seems to me to be what we in the church are to do. And that's what meant when it says about submitting. It's not about a harsh kind of, you must do this and you must do that type of stuff. That's not what kind of even leadership's about in the church. But actually it said right back there in the start of uh, the passage in Ephesians 5, it says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Out of reverence for Christ. If I revere Christ, if I truly honour him, then we including me, are going to submit to one another as we listen out, as I say Caroline does, on a Sunday morning, to what the rest of the music is, and sings in harmony with that. And when that happens, what a beauty there is. Don't it do, I mean, it does me good. It does me good. I, I, love, I love listening to harmonies, yeah? And when you see people working in harmony, isn't it beautiful? When I was in, sorry, this is not in my notes at all, but just my mind's just gone to when I was in Africa, um, in, uh, in Uganda it was, we were going on this path and there was this line across this path. When I say it was a line, there were thousands of ants. And I mean literally thousands of ants. It was a, it was a band about that wide, okay, across the pathway. Just of ants going across bands and forks and this and that, okay. And there were these, there was lots of these little ants, but then there were some of these bigger ants too. But all these ants were working in harmony with one another. And here's the interesting thing, okay? The moment one of the big ants, apparently they were detector ants, um, and the moment they detected my presence, they somehow sent a signal, I don't know how, but they somehow sent a signal to all the other ants, and all the ants went, gone. Just like that. And it's about, you know, those ants were listening to one another, and what was being said and what was done. And they were all working in coordination with each other. Such a beauty. Ephesians 4 says this, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now I just want to say this, is actually harmony requires some kind of hierarchy in terms of I have to listen out to someone else, someone else to lead and it can be all sorts of different people leading in different situations but there's a kind of hierarchy of command in those ants as the big ones gave this thing you need to lead and they all whispered yeah. now hierarchy has a very negative context in our culture but do you know what hierarchy really means? I didn't know this till this week so I'm not expecting you to know either it means Sacred rule. Sacred rule. Or holy rule. Isn't that fascinating? And so the word originally comes from the hierarchy of angels. That's where our English word comes from. Hierarchy of angels. Isn't that amazing? Okay. And, you know, hierarchy gets completely abused in human culture. <clears throat> but right from the outset, God set hierarchies in place. And what counts is how those hierarchies are implemented, that they are exercised appropriately as we submit <laughs> to one another in the church of God and elsewhere. 
So, under God, we're called to submit to one another within the Christian church. You turn over the page. Sorry, I might turn over the page like that. Holy Spirit and the church. 1 Corinthians 3 says this, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Do you, do you remember back in, you know, in the Old Testament, they built this glorious temple. And they filled it with gold and with the best cedar trees. And it was absolutely glorious place. They put their very best into it. It was a precious place. Why did they do that? Because God was going to dwell in it. And in reverence for God, they did the best they possibly could. My friends, church is God's temple. We already said about Jesus is present where two or three are gathered together. Here Paul's saying the Holy Spirit is present in us as a body. And that makes church such a precious place. A place to be revered and respected. Immediately before, Paul talks about what materials are we building with. We need to build with godly materials in the church which are going to last for ever. This actually means I need to bring, let me tell you a little story, okay? I'm not going to tell you where this took place, Sue and I, we've been here for many years, but before I moved around to various different towns and churches, and uh, one church I was, we were in, um, someone said, all right, I'd like to give the church our, our piano. Fantastic. The piano was a little bit if you at church, you know, that'd be great, but it, so it was agreed that I'd go around and uh, play it to check it out and make sure it was better than the one the church had already got. So I went around to play it. And um, so I went around and I played and I played and I played. It was, it was a beautiful piano, absolutely wonderful. So I, I really loved playing. It was fantastic. And um, I stopped playing. I thought, this is good. This is good for the church. And they said, oh, that sounds really good, doesn't it? I think we'll keep it. <laughs> Man alive! I couldn't believe it. I was like... <laughs> But, but here's the thing, are we tempted sometimes to give our second best to God? I mean, is, is God a God of our cast-offs rather than our first fruits? The Holy Spirit is here. He deserves our <coughs> very best. Lastly, it's me and the church. Me and the church. 1 Corinthians 14. This is what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or most three should speak one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who's sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Someone said, I think it was you said, wasn't it? Uh, we, we, come, we come to serve. We come to serve Christ, who's here with us. We come to serve the Holy Spirit, who's here with us. We come to serve one another. And I want us to notice that in that passage, it doesn't say if you come together, it says when you come together. There's an expectation that if, if we're not gathering together, what is church? We have to meet together. We have to be together. I encourage you to not give up meeting together, but to join together to encourage one another. It's kind of just assumed in Paul. It's part of what just the early church was. Let's just meet. And we do so with each one of us 
contributing. I want you to know this morning that you are a valuable part of God's church. I suspect that most of us here feel inadequate. But God's Holy Spirit is in you. And but what do we say? We sang that song, didn't we? His grace is enough. You don't have to be perfect, you don't have to be a super speaker, you don't have to be anything. You don't have to be super musical, or whatever. It does help sometimes if you sing particularly loudly to be roughly in tune, but, but you don't have to be, you know? It's about us being together, it's about us being family together. And, and if I'm not perfectly honest, I feel that as a church, actually in terms of our Sunday mornings, you know, I'd like to see more contributions into what we do. We have our family time at the end, which is, which is good. But it'd be good, you know, we've had times in the past when there's been more sort of bringing of tongues or prophetic words. And I want to encourage you now, encourage you to bring a scripture. Here it's got about bringing a song or something. You know, I mean, if God particularly lays something on your heart, let's, let's encourage one another in that. It's not that it's going to end up with chaos. But it's about us encouraging one another and building one another up. And each of us playing our part in that. You also play your part in different ways. Some of you put drinks on. Some of you got communion out. Some of you got, you know, there's all sorts of different roles in church life. All of which just encourages one another. Some of you give other people lifts and things like that. You know, some of you just contact each other during the week and ring each other and that sort of thing to keep contact and encourage one another in that way. There's so many ways in which we can encourage one another. But notice the purpose, so that the church may be built up. And verse 31, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. So I hope that you are encouraged this morning. Because Christ loves the church. And he's doing a work in us to cause us to also love the church. When we meet together, God is here, and God is a God of order, and we're called to submit to one another to bring harmony within God's church. God's spirit is here, we are his temple. We are to revere God and what he owns. And you and I are here, just as Christ came not to be served, but to serve. So you and I, are here to serve one another. May God help us and may we each live for his purpose. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.